I am 47 years old and married to Lisa, a 42-year-old female. We only lived as a couple for roughly seven of those 17 years. A decade ago, I discovered Lisa cheating on me, and she admitted that she had fallen out of love and desired an open marriage. We have two children. The elder was a toddler while the younger was still a newborn at the time. It was awful for me, she explained. Back-to-back -back pregnancies took a toll on her physical and mental health, so she wants to recharge. Unfortunately, her method of relaxation was to bring various decks to bed. Divorce was complicated at that stage, with two small children and a meager income. I decided to let her be raped while I moved upstairs in our duplex home. We became co-parents for our child. It wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. We split up with a lot of animosity and name-calling. It was mostly for me because she had cheated. But gradually, we got caught up in work, and I moved on and mellowed down. A few months ago, I met Kathy, a 35-year-old female at work. She's a junior at work. I was revived instantly. Bonding with her was the most natural thing that had happened to me lately. There was no romantic relationship at the beginning. We got along because we were empathetic co-workers who also spent time as friends outside of work. We only made out last month, but I had a great feeling about her. Since then, she has been frequently crashing at my house, which concerns my wife. Lisa is technically still my wife because we are still married. Lisa has been acting strangely lately. Weird because she always hangs out around Kathy and myself. She commands power in the same way that a wife does. I had to remind her that we are separated and I can do anything she has been doing for years. It's difficult to express what she's been doing, but let me try. Kathy and I were having dinner one evening in my kitchen. Lisa shows up and asks, Can I join you? It became an extremely awkward time for both of us. Kathy and I exchanged startled looks. Lisa sat down with her dish without waiting for a response. We ate dinner as strangers, smiling, uninterested in Lisa's dumb and forced chat. Our supper was ruined, but I gave Lisa the benefit of the doubt because she was simply trying to fit in. Then there was another incident in which she was bossy, attempting to impose her rights as a wife. Kathy and I were upstairs watching a movie. Lisa barged in and asked me to accompany her. I inquired, what is the matter? And she was like, your children need you. The younger one needs your assistance with a scientific project. I was astounded because we had divided the schoolwork for our children. I get to help the older child while she takes care of the younger one. I explained that I had previously done my bit with our eldest son and that this was now her responsibility. She became enraged and exclaimed, is this kid not yours? Instead of assisting him, you are here prowling around. What a crap. It resulted in a full-blown dispute between Lisa and me. Kathy felt uneasy, excused herself, and departed. Following that episode, Kathy stated that she will not be hanging out at my house, despite the fact that we will be meeting at hers. But why would I jeopardize my life when I have never touched hers? She has been living her life as she wishes, bringing any Tom, Dick, and Harry to the mansion. But I opted to look the other way. But now that I've found someone to bond with, Lisa is acting like a bitch and attempting to shatter it. When I addressed her last day, she indicated she wasn't concerned about my close relationship with Kathy. She refused to admit that she had been behaving up. She claims I was overthinking. I told her that if she kept putting her leg in my space, I'd consider getting divorced. She burst into tears and apologized for disturbing us. She was only concerned about our son's unfinished assignment and was preoccupied with her work, and that's why I requested for assistance. I stated that it was not a call for assistance. It was nothing less than gaslighting. She then contacted Kathy, apologized, and invited her to come over. Kathy accepted the apologies, but she set her limits and stated that she wants to meet me at her home. I'm currently in a fix. I want to get rid of Lisa right now. I'm frightened she'll ruin my moody friendship with Kathy. I'm thinking of obtaining a divorce. The only reason I did not file for divorce back then was that I did not want my children to have to pick between their mother and father. Now I'm wondering if I should just get over it and put myself first, even before my children. Should I wait a few years for my children to grow up before making a move? I'm not sure if Kathy would wait for me until then. I'm still unhappy with Lisa for deciding to open the marriage. I'm also upset with myself for agreeing with her and not pushing back enough. Sorry for the confusion and misinformation, especially with Lisa's adultery and our separation dynamics. People think it is difficult to give counsel without this clarity, 
So this is everything. It's going to be long. If you don't want to learn about history, you can skip this section. This was about ten years ago, so I could have missed a few specifics. Lisa began acting up four months after our younger kid was born. She did not allow me get close. She stated that she did not feel prepared for sex because pregnancy and breastfeeding had made her averse to intimacy. I supported her decision, but we were slipping apart emotionally. I offered we go to relationship therapy, but she dismissed it, saying it was just a postpartum thing and she'd heal later. After nearly a year, I lost patience and confronted her with the fact that we needed to address the elephant in the room. She either attends therapy with me or tells me the truth. What is wrong? She gaslighted the matter, saying I was being insensitive and so on, but I didn't let it go this time and dug out the truth. I looked through her phone but found nothing definite. She had deleted the majority of the chats and emails. I'm not sure how I received the signal, but one day she stated she was going shopping with her pals. I followed her car and caught her cheating. She was sleeping with a young college student back then. I barged into his home. Okay, not barged, knocked a shirtless guy as Lisa was on the couch in her lingerie attempting to hide herself. I had him by the neck and was ready to strike him when Lisa interfered and begged him to leave. She cried, saying it wasn't his fault. He is only one of the men she has been seeing. It blew my mind. What the hell? She confessed to hooking up with a couple of males. The guy standing in front of me had no idea what was going on or whether she was married with children. We returned home and I did everything any man in my situation would do. No, not hitting. I am a non-violent dude. I contacted her parents and confessed the facts in front of everyone. I insisted on the divorce. I even engaged a lawyer and addressed the situation. But when the matter unfolded and the lawyer disclosed the facts, it shook me. There was no genuine benefit for me, only loss. The youngsters were little. They'd probably only need their mother. I can obtain joint custody, but Lisa will have to allow me to meet with them and set the terms. Yes, of course I couldn't. If she fails to comply with the court order, she will be shown the door. But how many times would a normal man want to get involved in this police and order situation? We live in a no-fault state, thus no moral policing for her. I still need to pay alimony. Child support is unavoidable. So I basically handle all of the chores that come with being a dad. But I have to rely on Lisa to spend time with my children. Lisa, on the other hand, was opposed divorce. She proposed that instead of divorcing, we open our marriage and return to each other whenever we desire. I knew I never wanted her back, but divorce was too expensive at the time. Our only practical alternative was to separate, live as housemates, and co-parent our children. So we did it. Regardless, she can call it open marriage or anything she likes. This, I believe, is a dead plan. We're separated. Within the last ten years, Lisa has had numerous lovers, but she claims nothing meaningful with any of them. I believe she had at least three sexual partners. They arrived home, she went trekking and took holidays with them. It was difficult for me to watch her become knocked up. First, she cheated, and then she had other partners bang her in our bedroom. We own a duplex house. I moved the guest bedroom upstairs. The stairs leading to it are accessible through the back door. We bought the property from an Asian couple who built it so that their grown-up son could live upstairs with them in privacy. Unfortunately, the son moved out, and the couple sold it to us since it was too big for them. The main entrance to the house opens into a living area with a large closed kitchen with dining space, a master bedroom, and a storage room that we converted into our children's room upstairs. It was a guest room the same size as the master bedroom, with the rest of the space devoted to a massive library structure for reading and hosting parties. That space leads to the roof of the home, which has a little patio. Because I was moved upstairs, I could see much of what was going on down below. I hoped I could close my eyes, but for my children's sake, I remained watchful from the outset. I also went on dating sprees, but after a few months, I felt empty and pointless. I halted it. Instead, I concentrated on more meaningful topics. I joined a badminton club to improve my athletic body. I was a sports fan in college, so I returned to playing field games on weekends. I joined a hiking club that plans solo hikes every two months. It's as if you can't take your friend, spouse, or anyone else you know. You travel alone, and there will be a group of others who are also alone. So basically, you go hiking with strangers. It was so much fun. I did it for two years straight and now only do it twice a year. 
I've had a few hookups over the last ten years, but no emotional affairs or long-term relationships. I did not feel that connection with anyone else. With Kathy, things are different. I feel happier around her. She's the woman. I believe I can give love another chance. However, the demon of my life has also pursued me there. The scenario remains the same. Kathy refuses to come to my apartment. I'm frightened she'll withdraw herself from me, and I do not want to lose her. I'm having to make a decision between Kathy and my children. Update 1. Hello, everyone. Thank you for all your suggestions and remarks. I appreciate it all, both good and awful. Both. I went to therapy, which helped me a lot with knowing my focus point and what I desired in life. As you mentioned, the children are approaching adolescence, so it will only be a matter of time before they leave to conduct their own lives. And it makes no sense to pass up my chance to be happy with Kathy. I had an open discussion with Kathy. I told her about my feelings. I told her I wanted to be with her, and if she felt the same way, we could figure it out. She expressed similar sentiments, but is hesitant due to my family dynamics. She simply does not feel comfortable around my legal wife. She is fine with the children around me. I said, I can figure this out. I intend to leave. The youngsters can choose where they want to remain. They are mature enough to make this choice. They can also opt to alternate between mothers and fathers. Kathy voted for it. My therapist suggested that we take our children to counseling so that they might be made aware of our marital status in an age-appropriate manner. When I told Lisa about the counseling, she freaked out. She accused me of being selfish and insane for dragging my children into this mess, and that being serious with Kathy was interfering with her life, and I should put my family before my own selfish interests. This made me so mad. Really, Lisa, are you the one preaching nonsense about family and morality? What happened to your ethics while you were getting knocked up by various dicks while your children were still nursing and rolling around in their cribs? I asked her to back off and brought the children to the counselor. It was useful. The youngsters have taken it well. They appreciated us hanging around for so long for their sake. They also believe that I deserve to be happy for the rest of my life. I informed Lisa that I would be filing for divorce. She pretended surprised and began sobbing. She stated, I thought we decided never to divorce and to stay together throughout. When you found this woman, you decided to leave your family to be with her. I've also met a lot of men who wanted to marry me, but I never gave up my married life for them. I told them to quit attempting to guilt trip me. This is not helping. Cut the bullshit and sign the paperwork. I will pay for my children's education till they reach college. You can keep the house in your car. This would be your alimony. I will be moving out. I am prioritizing my pleasure over money because I can now afford it. Back then, I couldn't. She grieved and tried everything she could to get me to reconsider the divorce. She said I could move out and live with Kathy while remaining married. I said, I love Kathy and do not want her to be called my mistress. I know no one would call her that, but Lisa would. She can go to any length to humiliate others. The paper should be submitted on any day. I'm moving in with Kathy next month. I am waiting for my children's annual tests to be completed. I would take them on a trip and then move out. I'll be relieved when all of this is resolved for everyone. Update 2. I'm telling you, this woman is a true bitch. As I said in my previous report, I was on vacation with the kids. This woman seized the opportunity to carry out her nasty scheme. Lisa cries her way to Kathy, asking her to back off. She informed her that she was ripping our family apart and that our children would suffer as a result. Lisa tried to guilt trip Kathy, but she refused to budge. Lisa claimed that I was not serious about her and Kathy was just a fling for me. Lisa is a cunning, ruthless woman. She knows just how to play her cards. She knew I was in a low network zone with kids, so she told Kathy not to call me, and she didn't. If she were any other lady, she would be outraged by this fling comment. Kathy stayed calm and waited for my return. She had my hotel room number, but she did not bother me. That's what I adore about her. Despite the complexity of my situation, she is a secure lady. When I got home and learned about Lisa's spiteful move, I stormed to her door and gave her the shouting of her life. Should have done it sooner to get the garbage out of her brain. Her entitled behavior has gone too far and no one will tolerate it. I have moved out of my house. My children have also chosen to stay with me, but we don't have any spare rooms for them. So I'm looking for a larger house to accommodate my children. Until then, they are at their mother's.
Lisa threw a lot of tantrums as I was moving out. From guilt tripping to yelling, from gaslighting to tears and pleading, we asked for another shot at our relationship. I mentioned that our relationship was over ten years ago. We were only housemates and co-parents. The truth is that I have moved on from loving her. She's nothing to me. I love Kathy and want to spend the rest of my life with her. When the divorce paperwork reached Lisa, she tore it away. My lawyer had to issue her a letter, threatening to sue her for destroying a legal document. Only then did she melt down and agree to sign it. The divorce processes are on. I haven't checked upon my setbacks since then. I went to pick up my children twice but didn't enter the house. And certainly a lot of people asked about my children's age. They are 11 and 13 now, quite mature to understand the divorce and separation. Update 3. So delighted to inform that Setbacks is now my official ex-wife. The highlight of this update is the divorce is completed and my children have moved live with me that they would be visiting their moms every two weeks or any time they want to. The last month had been stressful renting a house and moving everything we had not told Lisa about children coming in with me till I rented a new property. The children and I all were aware that mom would break seven hells on us, so better to avoid or delay it as much as possible. The children indicated that they would keep their luggage packed and sneak off with me when Lisa wouldn't be there. Then I decided to go in a legal method. Don't want to get into another trouble with that woman. As per our divorce agreement, we have to give a three-day notice to each other if we intend to take our children for more than two days. So I went home and told her that the children wanted to move in with me and I would be coming in three days to pick them up. As expected, she freaked out. Good for her that she didn't go violent, breaking things and all. It would have played better for us. But no, she chose the emotional way, hugged the kids and cried, saying sorry for everything and asking them not to abandon her. She tried her best to emotionally manipulate them, to stay with her, and she was even successful in doing that with the younger one. He said that he wants to stay with Mama. Kathy had told me that situations like this could brew and I should be prepared for their last minute back out. So when he called, I said, Cool, Dad loves you no matter what. But the elder son still stood solid to his decision to move out. I said, Sure, I'll pick you up. I don't know what happened in between, but when I went to pick him up, both the boys were ready with their stuff. I hugged them both and shipped them away. I didn't ask them what happened there. It's already so traumatic for them. I don't want to scribble and torture them. Kathy and I are trying to make them comfortable at our house. We are involving them in setting up their room. Everything goes in there as per their taste. When the children were leaving the house, I was expecting Lisa to give her last try. But she had given up by then. She just sat there crying and sobbing. She hugged the boys tightly, told them how sorry she was about her behavior, and said she loves them, and they were free to come back to Mama's whenever they wanted. She asked me if I had a minute for a coffee. Her ask sounded naive and genuine, so I obliged. Her tone was remorseful. She apologized, and this time it didn't sound fake. She said I was delusional, all this while thinking you would never leave me when Kathy came into your life. I didn't consider her to be a threat. I thought her to be one of those flings that would fizzle out in a month. I guess I took you for granted because of the security you provided to me and the children, despite everything I did to you. I didn't realize I was mean and narcissistic. And when I did, it's too late, I guess. I just smiled and suppressed my emotions from flowing out. I stood up to leave. She came forward to hug me. I hugged her back. That was our first hug in ten years. I can't contemplate how I felt about it, nor can I express how I feel now. After the last talk with her, I'm neither happy nor sad, just numb. That's what it is. Last six to seven months have been quite a life-changing phase for me. I guess I would take time to process everything. But thanks for all the support. You guys have been the best. I might update the thread if something progresses from here. Now on to the next story. Wife cheated on me with her own cousin, so I exposed their affair to the entire family and divorce her. My wife and I knew each other our entire lives before we got married. It was a really sweet story of childhood friends who fell in love young and got married. When we started dating, we were each other's first kiss. She was the only woman that I had ever been with, and I thought the same with her. We were neighbors growing up, and we would often play together as children. I knew her family, and she knew mine. Everybody would always joke with us about how they knew we would be together forever. After we both graduated college, we got married and we started planning our future. 
We ended up buying a house for my uncle in our hometown so we could be close to our families. After a couple of years, we decided to start building a family together. We have two children, twins, and our life was perfect out of the blue. One evening, while we were watching a TV show, my wife asked me if I regretted never being with another woman. I immediately told her that I didn't. I'll admit that there have been other women I've been attracted to. Sleeping with them had never crossed my mind, though I loved my wife very much, and she was the only one for me. I asked her about why she brought that up, and she told me that she had just been thinking about it. She explained that she was worried that I would get bored with her. She brushed it off then, and we continued watching our show. When my wife was a teenager, her aunt married a new mandate. I remember it being a big deal at the time because her aunt went through a very bitter divorce and was staying at my wife's family home for quite some time. When she married the man, she ended up moving out. The man that she married had two children of his own around our age, so it felt like we had two new friends in the neighborhood. Both were boys, and they were always kind of rowdy. One of them, let's call him Paul, has always been a bit of a problem child. Paul would have wild parties, he would get in trouble, and he slept around quite a bit. Despite all of that, he was always very fun to be around. He was the life of the party. In his adult years, he's calmed down quite a bit. He had a good job, and he was on the straight and narrow. His only major issue was his inability to remain in relationships. They always seemed to fail before they got too serious, and Paul would get pretty beat up about it. Paul was dating a girl that he really liked, and she ended up breaking up with him. He was hurt. So he reached out to my wife and me to talk. My wife, being the sensitive and caring woman that she was, went over to his house to make him dinner and listen to him. I didn't go because I didn't want to overwhelm him. I never expected that anything would happen between them. She came home later that night, and when I asked her about what happened, she was very evasive with her answers. She didn't seem to want to tell me about what Paul said to her. I thought it was fishy at the time, but again, I never thought she was doing anything inappropriate with him. Looking back, a lot of how she was acting after that night seemed like she felt guilty. She was being very generous to me with a lot of things. She kept cooking my favorite meals. She surprised me with small gifts, and she complimented me all the time. She was normally nice, but it was a little over the top. It felt almost like a child who broke something they shouldn't have been playing with, trying to make up for it. About a week after the night she visited Paul, she went back. She told me she was going to bring him some food just to make sure he was getting something healthy to eat. I offered to come along so I could check in on him. But my wife told me that it would be better if it was just her. Just assumed that it had something to do with him being in an emotional state. I stayed back and put the kids to bed while she went to visit Paul. She came back a few hours later and told me that they had a long talk about everything. She didn't give me any details about what he said. She started to visit Paul by herself a lot more frequently over the next few weeks. As I said before, Paul dated a lot of women and broke up with a lot of women. I had never seen him so distraught over a breakup before. The more time my wife was spending with him, the less it was making sense. She came home one night and I asked her about what was really going on with Paul. I didn't think that she was sleeping with him, but I thought something else was happening. It was just also out of the ordinary. She stuck to her story about Paul being very emotional after the breakup. I offered to maybe go talk to him and give him some advice, but she told me that it probably wouldn't be much help. Regardless of what she said, I was worried about him. He was my family and my friend, and I wanted him to be okay. Over my lunch break at work the following day, I stopped by his house to check on him. At the time this was happening, my wife wasn't working. She was a stay-at-home mom and the kids were in school, so she had all day to do whatever she wanted to do. Her car was in the driveway when I arrived. She didn't tell me she was going to visit Paul that afternoon, so I was a little surprised. I approached the door ready to ring the bell and pop in to see what was going on. Before I even touched it, I could hear noises right on the other side of the door. It sounded like they were having sex and my wife was being pinned up against the door. I was frozen in place. That was absolutely the last thing I expected to see. I couldn't even believe it. I don't know why I did it, but I ended up calling my wife on the other side of the door. I heard her phone go off, and I heard them both freeze for a moment while she looked at it and rejected the call. I heard some muffled conversation as Paul asked her if she was okay. My wife told him that it was just a little weird that I was calling in the middle of the day, and that worried her. Paul made a joke about having something that could make her forget all about that. They started kissing again, 
and they walked off somewhere else in the house. I stood outside for a few minutes contemplating what I wanted to do. I just caught my wife having sex with Paul. Paul was her cousin, not related by blood, but he was still very much a part of the family. It took me a few minutes before I put everything together. I knew right away that it was over between her and me. Our entire relationship, all of the years we knew each other, was going to be flushed down the toilet. I was going to divorce her, and I was going to get proof of what happened before doing so. I knew Paul had a spare key hidden under a rock by his house, so I grabbed it and let myself in. I could hear the noises coming from the bedroom, and I made my way there. The door was wide open, and I pulled my phone out to take a quick video of both of them. After about 30 seconds passed, I knocked on the door and both of them turned around to look at me. They tried to cover themselves up and explain what was happening. The absolute funniest part of this was my wife chasing me out of the house, telling me she was only sleeping with him to help get his mind off the other woman, as if that made it okay. I was flabbergasted. I called off work for the rest of the day and sat in my car while I looked for a good divorce attorney online. I reached out to one and set up a meeting. While I waited for that, I went home and packed a bag to go stay at my parents' house while everything was figured out. I grabbed the kids from school and brought them along with me. My wife was blowing up my phone, but all I did was text her and let her know that I had the kids and they were safe. But I needed time away from her. The next time I saw her, I was serving her with papers. That just wasn't enough for me, though. She cheated on me with her own cousin destroying our family. I wanted to get back at her, for what she did. I thought about it quite a bit, and I realized that not many people would be understanding of their relationship. Again, he wasn't a blood relative, but he was still family. I crafted a heartfelt Facebook post explaining to everybody that after years of being together, my wife and I were divorcing. I explained what happened, sparing very little detail, I might add. A ton of family members commented saying that what she did was wrong and they were telling me how sour they were for what I went through. Later that same day, my wife and Paul both reached out to me and asked me to take the post down because they were getting very hateful messages from family and friends alike. I told them that I didn't have to take it down and I didn't plan on it. Both my wife and her cousin were pretty much barred from every family function that we had. They lost a ton of friends and pretty much everybody in our family shamed them for what they did. We lived in a small community and word travels fast. So when pretty much everybody in town heard that Paul slept with his cousin, it was a little more difficult for him to find new girlfriends. Both of them were humiliated by the post. My wife and I are divorced now, and I was awarded the house and all of our assets because I purchased them all. She has received no spousal support from me, and until she gets a job, I have primary custody of the kids. Here's the next story. A colleague caused trouble with a client leading to a $1 million deal being scrapped, but I was the one who got fired. The whole mess started 12 hours ago. My colleague and I had a business meeting scheduled. He arrived at the meeting place just in time in a terrible mood. Apparently his girlfriend had caught him cheating and dumped him. I believe he was to fault, but he did not appear to agree, and he vilified her all the way to the client's office. By the time we arrived there, his mood had not improved. He did not even acknowledge the employee who greeted us. He just clicked his tongue and walked to the elevator. His demeanor stayed consistent throughout the meeting, but the client's mood deteriorated gradually. The customer attempted to warn my colleague, carefully selecting their words honestly. I was relieved because I couldn't stand the guy and was glad someone else had spoken something. I figured if someone in a higher position spoke up, he might alter his mind. But then the difficulty arose. My colleague suddenly smashed his hand on the desk and began berating the client. Naturally, the client was offended and the agreement was cancelled. My co-worker didn't even apologize. He simply departed. So I had to apologize profusely. I apologized repeatedly. I hoped that the transaction might be salvaged, but it was obviously ineffective. We want him to apologize, not you. Please inform your boss that there will be no further business with you. The client departed the meeting room after saying such comments. On the drive back, I tried to think of an explanation to provide to our employer. The president favored my colleague. Even if I told the truth about the incident, I doubted that anyone would believe me. By the time I returned to the workplace, I still hadn't sorted out my ideas. As I was going to settle down at my desk, the president blocked my path and simply remarked, You've been fired. 
Following the event, my colleague arrived at the office ahead of me. I was apologizing to the client. He was telling everyone in the office that I had made a mistake. This is why the deal fell through. When I returned, everyone had already deemed me the perpetrator. The president ignored my side of the story. You've lost your job. Get out of there. You're pointless, he shouted, kicking me in the stomach. The president's harassment was widely known, and no one intervened to assist us. I was lying on the ground in anguish. He berated me throughout the day as I prepared to take over my responsibilities. I didn't have the energy to justify my innocence. I simply wanted to get out of the office. But just when I thought I was finished and could go home, I was assigned another duty, and I ended up working late into the night. Finally, when I finished my task, I went home on foot. And that's when I spotted an elderly lady continually inspecting her suitcase. Maybe she misplaced her keys. I could have just walked right past. But something stopped me. I got some bread and sat on a nearby bench. I watched the lady without her knowing. It wasn't merely due to concern. I would like to be thanked. For the past few years, I've worked like a horse in a thankless job. And today, I was dismissed as if it were nothing. I was extremely saddened to realize how easily I might be discarded. I felt as though no one needed me. But if I assisted this elderly lady, she'd undoubtedly appreciate me. Being appreciated indicated that someone needed me. I considered myself a valuable individual. I approached the old lady with a twist of friendliness. Hello, everyone. What is bringing you out so late? The old lady's eyes widened as if she were ready to speak something. Perhaps she is skeptical of me. But she quickly smiled and added, It appears that I have left my purse behind. She wandered around and pointed to a food stand. I wanted a hot dog, she remarked, gazing down. I imagined an elderly lady eating a hot dog late at night. It appears to be quite unhealthy, and part of me believes she should not do it. But she appeared to be really disappointed. That also made me feel sad. I'll do it for you. I removed dollar ten from my wallet. She appeared reluctant to accept it. Please accept it, I persisted, meeting her eyes. Thank you, she replied, clutching the dollar ten dollar as if it were something valuable. Today I really wanted it. I appreciate it. She thanked me multiple times. I promise to repay you. May I ask what your name is? If I tell her my name, I might have to meet her again. To be honest, I don't really want to connect with anyone right now. I nodded slightly and walked away without introducing myself. Following that, I began a part-time job doing road maintenance. It's hard physical labor, but the night shift works well for me because I don't want to run into any acquaintances. Every day is spent learning something new from scratch, work and sleep. Then work resumed. A month simply passed by. As usual, I was on my way home at daybreak when someone called out to me unexpectedly. I looked up and saw a tiny old lady standing there. She had a familiar appearance. Are you the hot dog guy? She stated with a pleasant smile. I'm happy to see you. So, come to my house. She pulled my hand and whispered, I'd like to thank you. She is quite conscientious. All this for a single hot dog. Maybe she'll make me a cup of tea. In these cases, I meant to refuse at first, but I was really thirsty. I promptly accepted her offer. I felt horrible coming into her house in my sweaty, filthy work clothes. But as long as I don't sit down, I won't pollute her home. I'll merely ask for some water and then go after a time. She came to a halt and unlocked the massive gate, declaring, This is it. We entered the house through a beautifully manicured garden. She led me to the living room, then disappeared into the kitchen, saying, I'll bring you some tea. It turned out to be what I expected. She appeared to be really rich. A garden that a gardener most likely kept. A western-style home that could be a movie set a living room with a high ceiling, and a massive chandelier hanging from it. I might not have ever been in a wealthy person's home before. I got a little excited and roamed about the living room while she was away. The chandelier and furniture appeared to be pricey, but the living room included no additional ostentatious decor. Instead, there were likely pictures of her spouse and children. I wonder whether the kids have moved out and she is now living alone. My... Did you discover anything that piqued your interest? Are you caught up in the family photo? When the old lady returned to my side, I didn't notice her. She leaned forward to examine what I was holding. I hesitated briefly before crouched down and showed her the photograph in my hands. It was most likely taken while picnicking near the lakeshore, behind the beautifully organized family. There was a calm lake, similar to the one in the group photo, a child who appeared to be one of her grandchildren, and the old lady, 
who remained unchanged, stood behind him, smiling widely. They were surrounded by three adult children and their partners. Everyone was happy and smiling. The husband, however, did not appear in the photograph. Isn't this from this year's lakeside picnic? The kids, you know, recommended we visit the lake after a long time. They were undoubtedly concerned about my being cooped up at home since my husband died. I couldn't find the correct words. The silence surrounded us. It would be good if I could say something to lighten the tone in moments like these, but that is simply not feasible for someone as socially uncomfortable as myself. The old lady was the one who broke the hush. Right, this. The old lady took my hand and slipped a dollar twenty into it. Many thanks. It only cost ten dollars. What an honorable person to return it. The old lady appeared relieved when I received the dollar ten. Let's have some tea. She persuaded me to sit on the couch, but I was dressed in soiled work clothes. I am sorry. Right now I feel a little unclean. I suppose I should stand. I stated this. I grabbed for the teacup, but the old lady halted me. You can't expect a guest to stand while sitting. Could you kindly have a seat? The sophisticated old lady had a motherly air of control and forced me to sit on the couch. I give it a lot of thought. The old lady sat opposite me and set a teacup in front of me. I drank the tea from the teacup, which was beautifully ornamented. I had no idea what the tea leaves names were, but the somewhat reddish tea was delicious. Thank you for allowing me to eat my favorite hot dog while saying this. The old lady also had a taste of her tea. To be honest, the beautiful tea in front of us seemed more appropriate for the elderly lady than the hot dog, yet we saw her leave for a late-night food stall. It was a hot dog. The elderly lady appeared to be a big fan of hot dogs. By the way, why were you in the park at such a late hour? I did not give an immediate response, so the old lady gave me a concerned look. I was genuinely dismissed from my work. When she heard this, the old lady stood up and sat beside me. Then, with her clean hands, she tenderly touched and patted my dirty work clothing on the back. A mistake made by a colleague was blamed on me, and I was told to leave that day. My employer refused to listen to my side of the story. He simply concluded that I was the blame. That was horrible enough, but there was something else that made my blood rush. A week later, when negotiating with a client, it was revealed that I was innocent. But there was no apology. It had been approximately a week since I began working part-time on a road construction crew. I received an unexpected call from the corporation. Please come back tomorrow. I couldn't understand what was stated. I went to our client to apologize. Right. They insisted it wasn't your fault. The termination has been canceled. Thus, please return tomorrow. Could you also stop by the client's president and inform him that you will be returning? Otherwise, our reputation will be entirely tarnished. Ha ha ha. What's so funny about this? I simply claimed I had no plan of returning and hung up the phone. After that, the phone continued to ring, but I did not respond. They dismissed me for a crime I did not commit with no apology. They want me to return tomorrow so that the corporation can save face. How much more selfish can you be? I raised my voice only to find the elderly lady had done nothing wrong. She was just concerned about me and wanted to know what happened. I am sorry. My voice rose abruptly. You should not be concerned about it. You didn't do anything wrong. The lady took a sip of her chili tea and said, There have always been people who conduct unfair dismissals. I got fired as well. It happened nearly 30 years ago. The lady began to talk softly. It seems that she worked in a jewelry store at the time. It was an old establishment that appeared to be doing well. I was fortunate to work with some excellent colleagues. It was difficult, but I enjoyed the job. Reflecting on the past. The woman laughed. Then she lowered her gaze. There was a commotion one day due to a lack of sales revenue. Of sure, I said. I knew nothing about it. But a co-worker claimed she saw me take the money. I stated that it was impossible, but no one listened. After work, the boss brought me in and asked if I would voluntarily resign one day before the shortage was revealed. Only the lady and her colleague were present. The lady claimed that the co-worker was heavily in debt. When I considered calling the police, they begged me not to. Why? There were suspicions that the manager and the co-worker were dating. The manager chose to defend his guilty boyfriend over the innocent lady. In exchange for taking the blame and resigning, they offered me a higher-paying job. I was amazed. I just didn't care and consented. She was then introduced to a job at a company that deals with the purchase of jewelry and antiques. 
It appears that this is where she met her husband. It did not take them long to start dating. Our work ethics and leisure activities were strikingly similar. Being by his side felt comfortable. A few years later, the couple married and had children, living a pleasant life. The lady whispered as she looked at her husband's photo on the shelf. Every moment spent with him was happiness. The day I met you was my husband's monthly anniversary of death. Every month on her anniversary, the old lady visits the food stall to have a hot dog. He appears to have a particular fondness for hot dogs. He always appeared to be enjoying himself while eating. That was his favorite stand. We frequently went there to dine. The old lady explained that eating the hot dog makes her feel like she's back on a date with her husband. But when I met you, I had inadvertently left my wallet at home. I was in some trouble. And then you saved me. She maintained a nice expression in her eyes, which made me very delighted. She gazed at me with such gentleness. You remind me a lot of my husband when he was young. I believed he had come to see me. That's why she was astonished. I was happy she hadn't mistook me for a suspicious person. Meeting you and eating that wonderful hot dog brightened my day. Strangely, just staring at her lovely kindness-filled face soothed my emotions. I am sorry. Why are you apologizing? The old lady panicked suddenly like if she remembered something. I apologize for being overjoyed about a day that was undoubtedly horrible for you. It's not appropriate for me. Her smile dimmed. She had a sorrowful and concerned expression on her face. And it started to make me sad. I was truly delighted to hear you say that. I told her, hoping to see her friendly smile again. True. I was wrongly accused and fired, making for a terrible day filled with anger and despair. But if I could help you, it was all worth it. That night, I had not lent her money out of generosity. My company abandoned me because I was unable to earn their trust. I wasn't sure whether I had any remaining value. Then I noticed the old lady in need. Helping a distressed old person may make me feel like I have some worth after all. I lent her money with such selfish motives. I was simply concerned with myself. I hoped that by assisting someone in need, I might be able to recognize some value in myself. Saying that out made me even more unhappy. I, I couldn't find the right words. The elderly lady hugged me as I began to cry quietly. I couldn't cry even when I was alone. They began to tumble in front of her. I apologize for losing it so quickly. It is acceptable to cry when necessary, even as an adult. It is a good attribute. Following that, I began to pay her a visit on my days off. It was incredibly relaxing, like being at home again. My heart has been considerably calmer and more peaceful since we reunited. I increased my productivity at work. I started working full-time three years later. I was recruited to work as a staff member since I was working hard as a part-time employee on a road construction project. I was filled with joy. However, there was a lot more to learn than I thought. Not only did I have to learn the on-site procedure, but I also needed to obtain some credentials for the future. It is steady, steady, steady. Every day I often return home and fall asleep right away. Nonetheless, I believe that my life is far more satisfying than it was previously. I consider myself quite fortunate. Hey, haven't you returned? How long do you think we'll be waiting? These Jews reverberate in the pitch-black void. I also work part-time at a music store. We're throwing a significant event today, a piano performance. Unfortunately, we are experiencing a power outage, putting us in total darkness after 20 minutes of delay. There is a tangible sense of irritation and rage among the audience. That's enough. I'm departing just as several of the tired audience members stood up to leave. I say I'll leave, as a part-time worker. In the darkness, I make my way to the piano. I use the piano keys. The keys are hard to see. There is no music sheet. None of that mattered. I begin playing each note intentionally. This moment would have far-reaching consequences for me. My name is Nick Johnson, and I'm 29. I work as a piano tuner. Actually, I work part-time at a music store. Some think it weird that I selected part-time job at my age. However, the store manager, who is genuinely empathetic, never pressures me to change my position. One day, the manager introduced me to someone from the business. Our store will be expanding soon, and this person has been transferred from another store to lead and oversee the expansion. Hello, my name is Allison. I'll be your manager. But you're all more familiar with this place than I am. Help me learn the ropes. Allison, who introduced herself during the morning meeting, was breathtakingly lovely. 
Her skin is healthy and fair, and her hair is short and glossy black. Her facial features are beautifully defined, and she appears to belong in publications or on TV rather than in a music store. The rest of the workers and part-timers are equally impressed. They can't think of anything other than how gorgeous she is, and she has left them speechless. Can I say something, Nick? The workday begins, and as I'm checking the pianos, the manager summons me. Allison is by his side. She greets each person individually. Nick Johnson is our part-timer. He works as a piano tuner, skillful but aloof. The manager shrugs, but I can't help but object. I'm courteous to the consumers. Yes, I know, yes, I know, that's not it. It is all about becoming more personable. He does not readily open up. Being labeled as a fatigued animal irritates me even more. I thought I was forthcoming with you. I wish you would reveal more of yourself to others, not just me. Right. So, Allison, if you have any questions regarding pianos, Nick is the one to ask. He's a capable technician, despite being a part-time worker. I hope he wouldn't have such high expectations. It is painful to disappoint others. But I can't say that out loud, so I merely avoid ambiguity to get through the scenario. Nick, may we chat about your shift the day after tomorrow? Allison approached me immediately after the morning meeting the following day. Yes. How about that? It is about where you will work the following day. Assisted at another store? No, I'd like you to join me for a concert. She hands me a flyer for a concert at a neighboring city's concert venue. Everyone who has played the piano is familiar with the performer. I've gone to a number of his gigs for work. We need to tune the piano before the rehearsal begins. We have a contract with him. I see. Why me, though? Aren't you tuned into Allison? Yes, but James highly regarded you. I believe it would be beneficial for you to obtain some work experience. James is our manager's name. Experience. I have no ambitions to get promoted, yet I am still a corporate employee. I should adhere to the policy in order to obtain experience. Plus, I have no reason to say no. I'm not enthusiastic about going to the concert hall, but if it's for work, I'll go. On the day of the event, I didn't hide my trepidation. I followed Allison across the hall, past the crew who were busy preparing, and onto the stage. Mr. Stevens, it's been a long time. Hi, my name is Allison from Cherry Music. Hi, Allison. Thank you for attending today. They exchanged greetings. Allison with John Stevens, the main pianist for the concert. They appear to recognize each other. Allison began working immediately, but Mr. Stevens appeared worried. Listen, Allison, this piano has been melancholy recently. Perhaps it's because of the new venue, but the sounds are off. Indeed. As he caressed the grand piano, the tone was unusual. The keys themselves were good, but each note appeared to flutter unpredictably like butterflies in the wild. Why would Mr. Stevens' piano, which is generally so well kept, act like this? Allison, frowning, was totally absorbed in her job. How's this going? Sweating removal. Allison took a step back from the keyboard. Mr. Stevens reached for the keys. He started playing his favorite piece. However, we are only three bars in. He came to a stop. No, this is wrong. He sounded annoyed. Allison had a dissatisfied expression. Her tune was flawless. The tones were harmonized, but the heart of the music remained disorganized. Sorry, please give me some more time, Allison. It's not you. I'll make the necessary adjustments throughout the rehearsal. Wait. I could not stop myself from whispering to Allison. Perhaps a brighter tone will help to align the sound. The tone has become brighter. If we modified that method, the sound might change direction. Wait, just a moment. Allison took my arm and dragged me closer to Mr. Stevens. Sorry to trouble you again, but please allow us a little more time. If this doesn't work, we will not charge for today's tuning. Okay, if you persist. I appreciate it. Then Allison positioned me in front of the piano while making excuses to Mr. Stevens about needing assistance and whatnot. She spoke to me in whispers. Try it. Me. I'll accept the responsibility. She handed me the tuning equipment, and I reluctantly began to work on the piano. I felt the disconnect the moment I touched the keys. The noise was greater and louder than imagined. Mr. Stevens was correct about the piano being uneasy. I concentrated on my fingertips in the ears, deeply engaged with the piano. After what felt like an age, I was content with the outcome. I finished by whispering to the piano, It's all right. Your voice is among the most beautiful in the world. I'm through turning around. Allison and Mr. Stevens were staring at me. 
Allison was surprised that she had stepped away from the piano, despite the fact that she was supposed to lead the tuning. Sorry. Mr. Stevens sat down to play the piano. You had a commanding presence. I couldn't make an interruption. Mr. Stevens immediately began to play magnificently after Allison spoke. The melody carried through the hall. Thankfully, the piano appeared happier now. The music grabbed both Mr. Stevens, who was performing, and Allison, who was standing by. I, too, became engrossed with Mr. Stevens's performance. Mr. Stevens stepped up and gave me a firm handshake after finishing the play. You're great. You did an excellent job repairing it. Mr. Stevens, I am glad you are pleased. Playing the second piece with pleasure led seamlessly into rehearsal. Relieved. Allison and I sighed and walked off the stage. Before the audience arrived, I sat on a bench in the lobby and watched the rehearsal on the monitor. I was meant to go back to the store, but Mr. Stevens requested I stay and listen, so they hurriedly set up a seat for me. Allison served me a cup of coffee from a vending machine. I appreciate it, that's my statement. She sat next to me and sipped her coffee, even when she was only drinking it. She looks like a commercial model. She did not notice my glance and instead returned it. What are you actually all about? Just a part-time employee at Cherry Music? I am not sure you understand what I mean. She pointed at the piano on the monitor. Nick, your tuning abilities are remarkable. That is difficult to believe. You're just a great part-timer. It was just good chemistry with the piano. Come on, Nick, are you there? A voice came from behind me and shocked me. I had an instant sorrow about being there. Seriously? Nick Lucas, an old college buddy, was standing next to a cart filled with packages. Long time, no saw. Still interested in piano? No, this is a whole different job. A different job? Lucas saw the tuning tools beside us and smirked smugly. Of course, the loser who embarrassed himself couldn't continue to play the piano. Why are you here? I ignored his disparaging remark. He tapped each box. Preparation for the concert. Today I'm with Mr. Stevens' agency, passing out leaflets at the reception area. Being popular and putting my face out there keeps me busy. I see. Will you be remaining for Mr. Stevens' performance? I suppose. Then try not to judge yourself negatively. You've always been terrible under pressure. Lucas exited with a stinging remark. Allison appeared to be unsure how to react. He is a former conservatory classmate of mine. Conservatory? Yeah, anyone can walk in. You inquired as to my identity. I'm truly nobody. But I majored in piano, so I have an excellent ear. That's all okay. We fell silent. Allison ceased to ask questions. The only thing filling the air was the sound of the piano coming from the speakers. James said you don't open up to people. Allison murmured, But you open up to the piano? Me? Open up to the piano. Did it seem that way? I no longer play the piano, but the fact that I'm still involved with work related to pianos. No, I don't want to think about it yet. Her words lingered in my ears. I was distracted until the rehearsal ended. After successfully expanding our store, Cherry Music decided to celebrate with an event. They planned the concert at a nearby hall, inviting contracted pianists, and they will sell the pianos used at the performance. All of it was Allison's idea. I thought it was a big business move, but the pre-event publicity was incredible. Whether people came for the piano or the performers, the seats sold out before the day of the event. I was busy as a prep staff member moving around the hall. Naturally, I was also tasked with tuning the pianos for the performance. All right, this should be good. I gave the well-conditioned piano a final polish with a cloth. I hope someone out there wants you talking to a piano. Might look weird to anyone watching, but Allison's words that I open up to the piano still resonated with me. Indeed, the time I spend at the piano feels right, even though I no longer play. I still want to share the beauty of the piano with others. So maybe she wasn't wrong. The rehearsal ended, and the audience filled the hall. Despite the heavy rain outside, it was almost full house. I stayed backstage in case of any issues with the piano during the performance, enjoying a prime spot to listen to the pianists. The concert was about to start any minute now as I glanced at my watch. The hall plunged into darkness. What? I looked around, but it was pitch black everywhere. The murmurs of the audience began to rise. Staff members using flashlights and smartphones scurried around backstage. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated. It seems that a lightning has struck nearby and has caused a power outage in the building. Please wait a moment while we work on restoring power. Staff shouted to the audience, their voices echoing in the dark hall. A power outage. Tough luck, but the backup power should kick in soon. I thought only the emergency lights glowed green as everyone anxiously awaited the restoration. However, the lights didn't come back on. Twenty minutes have passed since the outage. In the backstage, everyone was getting restless. When will the power be back? The backup system isn't working for some reason. Let's make another announcement. I could hear the staff discussing the situation. Hey, isn't it coming back yet? How long are you going to keep us waiting? We're leaving. This is ridiculous. The audience was losing patience. Some shouting at the stage and staff. A few people even stood up and headed to the lobby. Still no sign of the lights returning. This is bad. Maybe we should start the performance, but performing under these conditions. I overheard Allison and James discussing nearby. The pianists we invited today could play in the dark, but that's not the point of concern. Using them to calm down the audience seemed unfair. They were our guests, and we didn't want to disrespect them. Yet if we did nothing, the concert would be ruined. Nick James called me with a strained voice. I stiffened, understanding his unspoken request. He wanted to tell me to play, you can't be serious, I haven't played in years. You've been listening, though. That's different. James knew why I had stopped playing the piano. He had never pushed me to return. So why now in this situation? You love the piano and there's no way you can't play. I believe that one day you'll be back on stage. So I never said anything until today. But why now, in this situation of all times? I saw it as an opportunity. Opportunity? The stage is pitch dark right now. Nobody knows it to you, and they won't even suspect. With the power outage, no one's expecting a perfect performance. Even a child playing would satisfy them. That's... James was trying to lower the bar to help me muster up the courage. Nick. Allison tapped my shoulder. Actually, I've heard you play once. James arranged it. What? Just once. When you were in school at a competition, you heard that performance. I love that piece. Would you play it for me? For casual tone nudged me forward. Jeers from the audience were drowned out by Allison's encouraging words. You put a great spin on the opening part. Right. I really liked that. That was a childish arrangement. Was it? I was captivated. She sat down at the piano and opened the piano lid. It seems like she is going to listen to my performance next to me, right? I was playing for Allison. Forget the crowd. It's just us in this space. My fingers began to move naturally. Suddenly all sounds, but the piano faded away. No audience, just me and Allison, a familiar classic, played countless times, even after years of not playing. My fingers, arms, and feet remembered. I played my favorite phrases, the arrangement Allison liked. Some parts were challenging but beautiful. The music flowed, bringing back fond memories. Despite the break, the piano filled in where I faltered. I appreciate it. You're a wonderful piano, just a little longer. Stay with me. I let go and drifted in the sea of sound. Such a pleasant feeling. I wish to linger longer. Reluctantly, I played the last phrase as my hands left the keys. A blinding light engulfed me. I squinted and then slowly opened my eyes. Then a thunderous applause filled the space, looking up. I saw many people in the audience standing and clapping, some whistling. What's going on? Was this applause for me? What had I just done right? There was a power outage and I was playing the piano and now the lights were back on. No. I hurriedly stood up and ran off stage, but then I stopped. Nick James and Allison concerned were following me. I turned to face the audience, gave a bow, and then finally left the stage. Thank you for today. After my performance, the concert resumed as planned. I was in a daze until the cleanup was done, and James and Allison brought me back to reality in the calm of the dressing room. I sipped water, quenching my parched throat. The concert was incredible. You know, there were so many inquiries about who the pianist was playing in the dark, but I kept your identity a secret. Should I have told them? No way. I don't want to be the center of attention. I understand you feel that way. But nevertheless, your performance today was simply great. It was because to you, Allison, because you were there listening. I could play. I didn't do much. Rather, I was the one who dragged you into it, right? Even so, it was because you made me forget about the audience I could play. Can I chat to you about something? I shared with Allison how I become who I am now. 
I had been playing the piano since kindergarten and continue avidly through high school. By the time I entered conservatory, I was already renowned in the industry as a student pianist. It was during this time that I received my piano tuning certification. I wanted to be able to tune the pianos I played in my early college years. I was invincible in tournaments, frequently coming in first place. I was even described as a genius pianist. I was pleased to be highly rated, but what I enjoyed most was seeing people's responses when they heard me perform. However, as college graduation approached, I encountered a significant challenge. It was Lucas, a classmate from the same school. We knew about each other. I was taken aback when I unintentionally heard him play at a competition. His playing was raw and forceful, but with a sensitive rhythm. He was unknown before then, but he began to receive notoriety as a late bloomer. He also had a piano tuning certification, and our competition results were comparable, prompting repeated comparisons. Lucas then won first place in a competition that both of us participated. While I only finished 10th, it was our first competition together, and I was clearly showed the gap in our talents. I felt anxious, worried about being outdone by him, and began to prioritize rankings over the fun of playing in college. The results of the competition immediately became common knowledge. It was impossible to not care. Without the thrill of playing the piano, playing was no longer warmly accepted. I got afraid to perform in public, even though I performed well in rehearsal. It turned out badly in front of an audience. I made incredible mistakes and once got heckled during a performance. From that point forward, performing in public became a traumatic experience for me, and I developed an aversion to being the center of attention. Understandably, my reputation dropped. People I thought were friends started treating me coldly. It appeared that my ties were based on my popularity. I knew not everyone was like that, but it was difficult to determine who truly cared. Even people who were polite to me on the surface may loathe me. As a result, I developed paranoid tendencies. I developed a phobia of close interactions and distanced myself from others. I see. I apologize for forcing you to relate such a difficult story. Allison seemed sorry after hearing my story. No, I apologize for burdening you with my life tale. Why? Apologize? I am delighted you shared that with me. It demonstrates your openness, right? That's correct. She was correct. Talking about my trauma implied that I wanted her to know and I didn't mind her knowing, especially since she taught me to play the piano again. You were allowed to play sooner since you had no idea how other people saw you, right? It's all about your thinking and whether you can play in the future is a battle with yourself. A war with myself? Yes. Because you stated that the audience's reaction brought you the greatest joy, correct? Then you cannot ignore their existence. Her words caused me to realize something. Indeed, I was scared of the audience's gaze, but what I really noticed was their reaction. So the person I should be fighting is not the heckling audience, but myself. I have a suggestion, Allison explained, showing me a video on her smartphone. The screen was dark. Obviously, the recording was from my most recent performance. Did today's concert allow for recording? Mr. Stevens was present and recorded this. If you are comfortable with it, he would like to share on social media. What is the purpose? I'm curious if there's any demand for an unknown pianist, much alone a performance in the dark. Obviously, so that more people can hear your excellent performance. Of course, we will not use your name or reveal your face. I want you to see how others react when they hear it and how much your music moves them. Do you think it'll work? Yes, I guarantee it. The video went viral, just as she predicted. The post, titled A Miracle Performance in the Dark Amongst a Mishap, received countless congratulatory comments. Convinced. Now your piano playing can make folks happy. Allison showed me the comments as if they were her own accomplishments. There was even talk of doing an interview about the video, and I reluctantly consented. Every time I remember that day, I feel compelled to play the piano again. When I mentioned this to Allison, she enthusiastically proposed numerous possibilities to play beginning with tiny, locally organized competitions. I gradually gained accustomed to performing in front of others. Every performance that involved the audience's immediate reaction was enjoyable, and I began to participate more and more. Eventually, it was discovered that I was the pianist from the performance in the dark, and my name, Nick Johnson, became well known. Then I was invited to appear as a guest at a concert sponsored by Mr. Stevens. I was incredibly grateful to him for everything. 
After a practice, I was conversing with Allison in the lobby when Lucas approached us. He had indirectly prompted my withdrawal from playing, but it was due to a lack of skill. Regardless of his demeanor, I couldn't despise him and answered without reliving too much of my pain. I am performing today, yes. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Are you on the schedule to write backstage today? By the way, I heard you have a Cherry Music-sponsored concert coming up soon. Let me know if you'd like me to play a right. Allison cut in. I suddenly remembered something I recently learned about you. You messed up Mr. Stevens's piano. What? What do you mean? Apparently, he took over Mr. Stevens's tuning job by force, claiming to be affiliated with the same firm. He appears to hold a certain position in the office, thus no one has warned him. According to someone who observed the scene, he interfered with another tuner's work and modified it to fit his own preferences. Why would you do that? That explains why the sound was out of sync. It was because Lucas and Mr. Stevens played in quite different styles. Why did you do such a thing? Perhaps you were attempting to shift gears to become a piano tuner before your diminishing abilities became too apparent. This isn't just my speculation. I've heard that from colleagues at work. Apparently the observation was correct. I was going to make a mistake in front of Mr. Stevens. But thanks to you, Nick, you saved me there. But I had to disclose it to the office since ignoring it would harm our brand. Also, I was startled to learn that you are not particularly popular among the office girls. When I mention your name, they all seem upset. They complain that you are demanding on dates and make unwelcome physical contact. And behind the scenes, you've been disparaging Mr. Stevens. I have also reported this. Lucas went pale. Perhaps this is why he was on the backstage team today. Perhaps you were talented once, but it appears that you became overconfident. You can always start afresh. I recommend starting off as a music star, part-timer, eventually, Lucas. His contract was not renewed, and as rumors spread in the tightly knit business, he struggled to find another job. I heard he ended up working part-time at another music business, but I'm not sure if Allison's advice had a factor. As for me, I am still at Cherry Music. I became a full-time piano tuner and occasionally performed in concerts. Aren't you hoping to become a full-time pianist? Allison inquired. Concerned. Part of me performs for you. I don't intend to leave Cherry Music. I could see her blush at my remark. I recognized what I'd implied. No, it is not it. Of course, I want people to hear me. But having you, who helped me overcome my pain, present makes me glad. My remarks sounded like a love confession, and I eventually asked her out. Surprisingly, she agreed without hesitation. We got married within a year. Finally, you have opened your heart not just to the piano, but also to me. Looking at her with a pleased smile, I realized that the piano is more than simply a tool for competition. It is also something that offers joy to people. It took me a while to discover something so apparent, but from now on I intend to treasure both my sentiments and the piano. Here is the next story. My name is Carter King. I have elderly parents who claim they are not my biological kin. My biological parents perished in a car accident when I was quite young, leaving no relatives to care for me. I was placed in a foster family and raised there until I turned five. I felt lonely because I didn't have a mother or father. Mealtimes with great cuisine made me happy. The only thing I looked forward to was when an elegant old couple visited the facility. It's a foggy memory, but I recall them beaming as they watched me eat. They had such nice smiles. The kings eventually chose to adopt me. I rapidly warmed up to them, addressing them as grandpa and grandma. They had a small garden where they produced vegetables to sell at the local farmer's market. Despite not making much, market leftovers and those that were not excellent enough for sale ended up on our table on a daily basis. I adored grandma's pickled cucumbers and potato soup. Be grateful for your meal. This was grandpa's motto. Many people are currently going hungry. We must be grateful for each meal. Carter, I hope you grow up to be able to aid those who are hungry and in suffering. Yeah, got it? I nodded gravely, and he grinned softly. His wisdom has remained ingrained in my heart. We lived a basic, non-luxurious life, but were raised with a lot of love and happiness. I assisted with farming while in high school. I considered finding a job after graduation to help with our family finances. But Grandpa advised, do not worry about money. Do whatever you want to do. I believe he understood me. I wanted to do something that would benefit others in the future. However, at the time, 
I lacked information and didn't know where to begin, so I decided to attend college to learn about social work, economics, logistics, and other topics in preparation for times like these. Grandpa explained as he handed me a bank book that the account was in my name, Carter King. He'd been saving for my schooling. I was moved to tears by his consideration. After enrolling in college, I intended to start studying hard. I felt both thrilled and bad for causing difficulties for my grandparents. I'd never seen them indulge in any luxury. They always put me first. I promised to reciprocate them gratitude in a huge way once I started working. With that in mind, I focused on my academics. Four years have passed. After graduating from college, I started working for Inspiring Foods, a food firm. Inspiring Foods not only manufactures and sells food items, but also promotes social welfare through food. Grandpa told me about it. A friend of his worked there, and he happened to hear about it. Perhaps the job you are looking for is available here. Grandpa suggested I be assigned to the sales department, where I worked hard to copy documents, enter data, and handle phone calls. I arrived at work ahead of everyone else and reviewed the documents to learn about our products. I also accompanied professional salespeople during their trips. I intended to swiftly learn the profession and become a full-fledged employee. However, there was one individual who did not think highly of me. That was Eric, the chief of the sales department. Eric was also a board member with considerable power within the corporation. There were rumors that he didn't see the need in working with people who couldn't assist him advance in his career, which was especially difficult for newbies. True to rumors, I was swiftly targeted, watching me beg a co-worker for permission to do anything. He seemed to believe the newcomer was overpowering and cheeky. One day he appeared at my desk and instructed me to create a proposal for a new product. You seem to be a dedicated worker, so you can finish it in a day, correct? Excuse me, that is a bit. What? I'm responding as a novice. I apologize. I am unable to object. I gathered all of my ideas and put them together into a plan, which I delivered to him. Grandma's cooking sparked the thought for a stir-fried veggie sauce. Eric looked at it and scoffed, returning the idea to me. Who would purchase something like this? Our clientele wants something more upmarket. We don't need inexpensive items like these. Have you never eaten anything good? I'm afraid I'm not too familiar with expensive items. Could you please give me some advice on how to improve? Use your own brain to think. That's perhaps too much to expect from someone reared in a poor home. Yes, sir. To be honest, this happens virtually every day. Going to work became a struggle. But I had a cause. I simply couldn't quit. I fantasized about taking my grandparents to a posh restaurant with my first salary. I was certain they had never been to such a magnificent place. I assumed they hadn't eaten out that often to raise me. They must have made numerous sacrifices. I wanted to treat them to a little luxury for once. I wanted to spoil them with an incredibly excellent feast. They reared me as if I were a member of their own biological family, and I wanted to repay their gratitude as soon as possible. A month had gone since I joined the company. I finally got my first paycheck. I was proud to make money by my own efforts. One of my co-workers recommended an expensive restaurant where he had previously entertained guests, so I arranged a reservation for three and contacted my grandparents. They were astonished when I suggested going into such a luxury establishment, assuming we were going to a family dinner or something. Are we actually going to such a posh place? Grandma seemed a little bewildered. I received my first paycheck. As a working adult, I earned this money. It has always been my ambition to treat you both. Tears welled in her eyes. It's all due to Carter's attentiveness. Let us enjoy the feast without holding back, Grandpa said, joyfully nervous about our first experience in such a restaurant. We entered from a rear room. The door opened and I heard a familiar voice. Eric came out. Hi, good evening. I immediately straightened my stance and greeted him. Why are you here? He stared at me with curiosity. Just had dinner with my family, I responded timidly. This is the venue to entertain key clients, not for ordinary people like you. He examined us before continuing. It is inappropriate to enter a restaurant dressed so casually. Even if you eat expensive food, you will not recognize its value. Why don't you visit a cheap diner around the corner? His words struck my heart. It was one thing for me, but I also made my grandparents feel horrible. That was hardly the filial piety I had hoped for, and it left me feeling frustrated and shocked. I couldn't say anything then. 
Grandfather, who had been quietly listening, spoke up. You are the one who doesn't fit in. I had never heard him use that tone before. Who do you think you are speaking to? Eric began violently approaching Grandpa, but when he saw Grandpa's face, he screamed loudly, Mr. King! He suddenly turned pale and sat down on the spot, bringing joy to everyone via the power of food. Grandpa muttered, that was the corporate strategy behind inspirational foods. I had been meaning to talk to you about it, Carter. Are you prepared to hear me out? He began speaking gently. Our family has possessed huge estates for decades, allowing us to live without poverty one day. Over 30 years ago, the president of Inspiring Foods approached us about purchasing our farm. He planned to expand his company by building a factory. After further discussion, I discovered that Inspirational Foods had been donating meals to children in foster care. The president grew raised in an impoverished family and often went hungry. He was driven to offer great meals to as many children as possible. He was enthusiastic about developing his business to help additional orphaned children, families, and others in need. I was greatly struck by his emotions. My wife and I have always adored children but have been unable to have any of our own, so we decided to support his cause. We maintained only the land we needed for our livelihood and left the rest to him, following the principle of spreading happiness to everyone via the power of food. I became a shareholder in Inspired Foods and contributed to their investments. I promised to utilize my money to aid those in need. We have remained in touch ever since, and one day I went to the foster care with him. That is where I met you, Carter. While other children complained about not eating veggies or demanding pizza, you were the only one savoring your dinner, saying delicious with your mouth full. It was just wonderful. I wanted you to be a part of our family and share meals. So we adopted you. You grew up to be a kind-hearted young guy who understands empathy. That is why I believed you could be useful at a firm like Inspiring Foods. That is admirable. Eric rose up and extended a hand to Grandpa. I made a small mistake earlier. Carter is a very talented person, he remarked, forcing a smile and going forward. Grandpa called. We rejected his handshake. It is too late. You will never realize the genuine worth of a meal, the importance of sharing a table with loved ones. Inspiring Foods is a corporation dedicated to saving lives through the power of food. You have no right to refer to yourself as a part of Inspiring Meals. It was the first time I noticed Grandpa raising his voice. I'll update the president on everything during tomorrow's shareholders meeting. When you return to the office, do not expect to find your seat. Eric trembled and rushed away, as if fleeing the scene that day. The three of us ate a magnificent feast. They told me numerous things I didn't know previously. I was also able to tell them how hard I had been working. Did I successfully reimburse you, to a certain extent? Of course. You've matured and are now a responsible working adult. That's sufficient payback for us, Grandpa replied with a joyful expression. Grandma added that today's lunch will be an unforgettable memory, and she was thoroughly enjoying her time with the three of us. I felt our family tie grew stronger than ever before. Eric was missing from work the next day, terrified that his harassment would be discovered. He had disappeared. In fact, following my case... There were other complaints from other new hires and employees who had been harassed by him, prompting his resignation by the board. Gerald, the colleague who had recommended the posh restaurant to me, was named the new head of the sales department. He said, No one has worked as hard as you in their first month, complimenting my efforts. He even reviewed the plan. Eric had rejected several proposals that you could become president one day, he continued with a giggle, expressing affection. I hope to continue getting experience and one day be a part of a business that provides great meals to those in need. For the time being, I'm devoted to giving my all to the task at hand in order to help others have good moments around the dining table. Today, I labor for the greater good of society. Thank you for taking time to hear today's story. If you love this story, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you have a tale to tell about your or someone else's circumstance, please don't hesitate to contact me. Take care.